Her work includes influential films such as Monsoon Wedding, Mississippi Masala, and Salam Bombay. It's storytelling that's local and universal all at once. Filmmaker Mira Nair's newest work, A Suitable Boy, closes this year's Toronto International Film Festival. It's a captivating BBC miniseries based on Vikram Seth's epic novel of the same name. And we're delighted to speak to Mira Nair from her home in New York City. Oliota <laughs> Nyebo. <laughs> it's really nice to speak to someone from Uganda. But before we talk about uh, A Suitable Boy, we do have a little clip uh, of the series. Sheldon, could you please roll? No one can be sure of what the future will be. You will marry a boy I choose. I don't think I ever want to get married. India is a free country now. Your sister, my brother, I'm supposed to be next. Who is he, this boy you have been seen with? We should follow our own path. Nobody ever meant anything to me till I met you. His obsession with that woman. Have you no shame at all? He's a Muslim, Lata. Your family will be against him. One day I will make you proud. I am determined. I won't give up until I found my Lata suitable boy. Uh, wow, what an incredible series. And it's closing the this year's Toronto International Film Festival. You waited a long time to adapt Vikram Seth's book into film. Why was this piece of writing important to you? Well, I've loved uh, uh, Vikram's A Suitable Boy pretty much since the day it was written. You know, it's the it's set in 1951, an era where India was independent now, three, four years. Actually, the same year my parents got married uh, and moved to a different part of India. That was Nehru's India, is to make it as secular as possible. So if you were from the north, as my parents were, you were posted way east or somewhere far. And it was all about creating a new country, a new country in freedom, a strong and ancient culture, but also bewildered by the by by the English being there for more than a hundred years, um, finding out who we are, and that's what Vikram did, I think, so exquisitely in a suitable boy. It's a tale, a vast tale of four uh, elite families uh, at that time, um, and each you know, trying to find out who we are, were. But at the heart of it is a 19-year-old, 20-year-old Lata story, this young woman whose mother is determined to find her a suitable boy mm -hmm. uh, and determined for her not to fall in love with the Muslim boy that she is in love with. Uh, being a Hindu post-partition when India was divided between you know, Pakistan and India, and these are tensions that we were still living with, we continue to live with, uh, and how this mother traverses India, literally looking for a suitable boy for her unmarried daughter. So it's a epic tale, uh, very personal, but very political, and that is what I loved about it. It, um, it, it looks at us unflinchingly, uh, but with a great amount of humanity and love, and sexuality and mischief and all the things I also love. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's, it, took, it took a long time to get made because people don't finance uh, sagas with brown folk in it, you know, for a long time. And uh, 25 or more years later after the novel was written, I heard it was being made again by the BBC and I just uh, had to direct it. Well, I mean, it's a story to tell uh, for years to come. The fact that you completed it during a global pandemic. Now, you've mm -hmm. described A Suitable Boy as the Indian War and Peace. What did you mean by that? Well, um, not literally, but, uh, but just because it's such an epic tale that talks about a time when a country comes into its own. Uh, again, an epic political canvas, but at its heart, a human story of people and old friendships and new borders and how we traverse. Uh, you know, in that sense, uh, it's it's like a 
Chekhov novel like a War and Peace, like those sagas, but Bikram tells it with very much the language and the poetry and the music and the culture of, of modern India. Well, the book is a uh, whopping 1,300 pages long. <laughs> I I'm guessing you must have uh, experienced some challenges in trying to adapt that into film. What were those challenges? Well, um, I, I must say, when I entered to direct The Suitable Boy, Andrew Davies, a master screenwriter who had, in fact, done War and Peace and Les Miserables for the BBC, had already adapted eight hours of The Suitable Boy. That was the scripts that I got and, and read, and I thought they were masterfully distilled. Um, when I started ent uh, working with him, uh, I brought politics more to the fore um, and um, less made it a pride and prejudice, you know, like which boy will she marry? That is, of course, the fun of it, and that is the story of it, but it is a story that is inextricably bound um, as India goes preparing for its first national election in 1952, and the country is asked to vote for the first time, the people, mm -hmm. for their own. And so for me, it was an equation between the young girl, Lata, and the country, India, each finding itself as they moved towards this new moment of a democratic free country. You say that you brought politics to the fore. Why did you do that? Well, what I... What I'm inspired by, even through my childhood and seeing my parents and my, that society in early 50s really believe in this extraordinarily syncretic, plural, um, multiple, you know, secular nation, that was the India that we fought for and we wanted to create and Nehru really set off on creating. That India is quite different from the India we are confronting now, where borders are much more, you know, are, are being erected, you know, real schisms between the Hindu and Muslim communities. That intertwining, which is our strength and our plurality, is being obliterated. Um, and, and, and this is something that I think is just not the heart of who we are. And I wanted to very much hold a mirror, as Vikram does in The Suitable Boy, to that time when despite the horrors of partition, despite the bloodshed, despite the tension that created India and Pakistan, there was still a great syncretism between Hindu and Muslim cultures, between our music, our poetry, our language, our struggles, and our friendships, most of all. So the, in Suitable Boy, the old friendship between the Nawab Saab and Mahesh Kapoor, the Minister of Land and Revenue, is a friendship that I grew up around and that is very much equally Indian in both parts, but now quite rarely seen or not spoken of in the same way. Uh, and that's just the least of it. Um, the, 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 the culture of the courtesan, for instance, the, uh, you know, which is so sort of eloquently written and I hope done justice to in the film, uh, played by one of our legendary stars, Tabu, who is reclusive and hardly ever appears. You know, she's Saida Bai and she sings the language of the great poets of Ghalib, of Dag, of Mir, of the, 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 the Urdu sort of great refinement of poetry and song, mm. which again, you hear, but you don't hear in the same way that we were raised in. Um, and just the fact of the temple, you know, being built in front of the mosque, what has just happened in Babri Masjid's demolition and the creation of uh, the new Ram temple, um, is it also a storyline, in fact, in Suitable Boy, um, and uncannily like truth. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these are moments in time that are happening and that, um, and that I didn't certainly want a Suitable Boy to be like a museum piece of back then, uh, a sort of a pleasant trip down memory lane, but much more a mirror to where we came from mm. and where we are heading. Well, you mentioned Mirror a couple times, and um, I wanted to quote something that you said. Uh, just to uh, reiterate, the series is set in the early 1950s, just after the partition of British India into India and Pakistan. And you've said, and I quote, I wanted people to watch A Suitable Boy and understand that it is a mirror to what we're facing today with the repressive nature of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government. You can choose to emphasize those parallels, or you can choose not to, and I very much chose to. You mentioned some of those uh, parallels. Were you um, concerned at all uh, 
with potential backlash you might receive back in India? Well, I hope that our, you know, I know, I see it all the time, a, a sort of quietening, uh, you know, of anyone who, or even the misunderstanding of, of the of the free, the right to speak. Um, um, I am, you know, I am concerned. It is my home and it is my place. And But I hope that I will always, uh, you know, have a home there because e e equal to holding a mirror is... Um, is a lot of love and 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 uh, great admiration for who we are as a, as a culture and as a people. So I certainly hope that I will not be seen as somebody on the other side. Do you also hope because um, watching this series, I kind of knew about the partition, but I didn't really know uh, the details. It's not something that I that was taught in in our history classes. Mm -hmm. Do you hope that people will become more curious about this? and learn more about that part of India's history? Yes, I mean, of course, a, a, a film can just transport you into that time and that tale. But I certainly hope people will uh, want to know more. Um, at the same time, though, I, I really resist making films that feel like homework and that make you <laughs> want to learn so too much. I just want to take you away, you know, uh, and at the same time as taking you away to make you see yourself on screen, to relate to that. And then, yes, of course, to open so several doors to find out really why are we where we are. I mean, um, I find that very powerful to have our culture, our language, our people who look like us on screen, because that is the power, really, of storytelling. And it's been a long time when we have not seen our stories on screen. Well, uh, you, uh, just to follow up on what you were just saying with representation, um, it bears mentioning that this is the first BBC period drama with a cast consisting entirely of people of color. There's been a lot of discussion about diversity representation in film in recent years. Uh, what is the value of seeing characters and especially protagonists that look like you? Well, uh, that is a very strange way of describing a suitable boy as the first time people of color on screen because hey wake up this is a story of people who look like us and yeah you can call it people of color but it is a story about india and here we are you know why cast it elsewhere why not cast it where it's supposed to where it's come from you know so i find it slightly bemusing that that you know it's the first time people of color i think it's uh, you know wake up it's about time if you if you make elect these stories to happen, then they have to be told properly, you know, with those who have been its heartbeat. Um, so, Nam, I have been doing this for 30 some years, you know, always been the peculiar, odd one, you know, who's not, you know, who's throwing several languages like Indians we speak, Punjabi, English, Hindi, uh, and English all in one sentence. You know, that was the language of my one of my films, Monsoon Wedding. The namesake is a smattering of Bengali, English mixed with American, because that is what we are, mm -hmm. you know? And so, I, and I, I, it amazed me, you know, to be able to see that finally, or in, within a few years of making films, like when I opened Mississippi Masala, that was exactly 30 years ago, an interracial romance between an African-American man and an Asian woman. Uh, in fact, now they joke and say Mississippi Masala is Kamala Harris, you know, <laughs> is the embodiment. <laughs> she is the embodiment of that romance. But then it was completely radical, uh, more than it is now or it's equally radical now but you know the power of seeing ourselves on screen is beyond words uh, because um, it gives people the ability to dream that they too have a story mm -hmm. and they too matter and they are not the other because so many of us have come from elsewhere and have come into a place where the people don't look like us and sound like us and and but we they dream like us we are the same in so many ways. So, but, you know, always being that person to be uh, the first, not the first only, but also even with Suitable Boy, the budgets for people like us, mm -hmm. even however magnificent and sweeping they may be, are not the budgets for the crown, as I always say, you know. But still, our my work is to not let you see my struggle, is to take you away, is to sweep you into something that actually will see you will see yourself in. 
you know, beyond these patinas of layers of color of this or that or the other. The human heart is the human heart. The human struggle is the human struggle. So that's what I do or try and do. But it's a it's really uh, about time that we as a world are waking up to this because it's been terrifically lonely so far. Well, I, you mentioned Missis Mississippi Masala, and um, that was uh, 1989. And when you just said that yeah, it's equally radical now to have, um, say, uh, a black man uh, opposite uh, a South Asian in woman. Asia. Um, so you did this in 1989. <laughs> 1991. 1991. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but you've been in Uganda since 1989, right? Yes. That's okay. when I went to research it. Uh, and then fell in love with Uganda and and my husband and have lived there ever since. Uh, so yeah, so the movie came out in ninety one, but the process started in eighty nine. But you did that back then, um, and I I remember watching the movie and I remember a little bit of the backlash. I didn't really understand it. Why did you do it then? If other people are doing it now, I'm assuming that you must have received so much negativity back then. Uh, and times are different now. I think you can find. Uh, a broader community, a global community, but back then, not so much. Well, I did it. There's no timetable to, you know, why you do things. At least I don't have one. But I did it because it was something, as a brown person, uh, I came from India uh, on a scholarship to study at Harvard. I was a brown kid in the middle of a black and white community, and I was invisible and accessible to both, in a way. And that that hierarchy of color as i saw it that between being brown between black and white was something that intrigued me you know in my experience own personal experience and that led me to making mississippi masala years later you know so i didn't have a timetable it was something that i have myself gone through and and in the ugandan expulsion in idi amin's expulsion of 1972 when he when he you know, just asked, gave 90 days to all Asians to leave a place that they had known and lived in as their home for three or four generations, like my husband's family, for instance, suddenly expelled to different refugee camps across the world. Uh, many of them oddly came to Mississippi, do you know, you know, and, and bought these dirt poor motels and started, the Ugandan exiles really began to own uh, Mississippi motels, which I thought was the strangest trick of history, because Mississippi, as we know, was one of the birthplaces of the civil rights movement. And I thought, what, you know, here is an African American community that have never known Africa as their home, and here is an Asian African community coming in that have never known Asia, never known India as their home. Africa was home, you know, East Africa in this case. And what if the borders crossed? You know, that was the premise I began with. Um, and actually, to correct you, it was not faced with a lot of negative publicity. In, in fact, it was a commercial success, uh, especially with Denzel Washington and Sarita Chowdhury in her first role, very incendiary chemistry between them and so on. It was quite a success. Um, this, the criticism came from the Indian community, you know, in, 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 in this country, you know, who felt threatened that I was encouraging their daughters to marry you know, they came up to me on subways and they would say, what do you think, that every black man is Denzel Washington? Mm. <laughs> Why don't you make films on us? They would say, I'm a doctor, I have a Porsche, you know. Here's the film. <laughs> I said, I need to sell tickets. You know, the minute you're interesting, I'll be there. But <laughs> but yes, that type of criticism. But, um, but generally, it was actually, Nam, one of the first portraits of what they called hybridity of the biracial, of the interracial, uh, you know, union and, and that idea, you know. And for me, what was really astonishing, uh, living six months in Mississippi, you know, with my writer, Suni Tarapurvala, and, you know, doing research and so on, what was interesting was the incredible commonality between the Indian families and community and the African American community there. The, the, the getting together, the cooking together, the religion that was so important, the, the, the places to hold each other tight were actually the same. Mm. But ne'er the twain could meet, you know, except for commercially, you know. And, and it was, uh, it's very interesting and quite the same, I would say, even now. What was it like to work with uh, Denzel Washington? Oh, it's, it was, he's consummate, you know, he's a consummate actor and just so deeply 
comfortable in his skin, you know, in front of the camera, uh, out of the camera. Of course, now he's a wonderful director too, and we we have a different kind of friendship of colleagues. Mm. Uh, then he had just won the Oscar, although he had just begun in his life in as a career, and I had made one film, Salam Bombay, um, which was uh, quite a hit, but just one film. And and I remember I made Mississippi Masala in a kind of stupor of love myself. I had just fallen for my husband, and and for and I was really knew what that was feeling like. And I was not quite getting it from Denzel's character in Mississippi Masala with Sarita. Uh, and I remember psyching myself outside his trailer in the cotton fields of Mississippi saying, how do I tell this guy, you know, that to make me feel like I feel? And I went into his trailer and I said, you know, Denzel, you're just consummate. You can do the, you know, industrious big brother. You can do the noble son. You've done everything just perfectly. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Get to the point. And, and I said, but, you know, it's this weak need love, baby. That I, you know, <laughs> you want to bring the fire. If you, I, I'm in a stupor and you need to get me to feel that stupor. He said, he looked at me and, and he said, and I said, let me just tell you that the women and the men, but if you if you show me that vulnerability, that surrender, then we're going to have an interactive audience. You know, it's good. they're going to swoon for you. Mm-hmm. And somehow that lit a bulb in him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you um, talking about, we only have a few more minutes and I want to get a, a couple more questions in. Um, but you actually, speaking of Uganda, you started a free uh, film uh, school called uh, Maisha Film Lab um, for inspiring filmmakers in East Africa. What prompted that? Well, I'm so happy and thrilled about Maisha, which is a Swahili word, as you must know, which means zest for life, which is the name of our free school, now 16 years old and about 800 alumni. Um, I, including, you know, I, including some, yeah, yeah, other- including some lovely stars like Lupita Nyong'o's first film was made in Maisha. Uh, and and uh, and and many of the greatest uh, filmmakers in the world have taught there as mentors, from Abdirahman Sisako to Vishal Bhardwaj to uh, to you know so many people who've just come and offered their their services to us. Because I still believe that people want to do good. You just have to create places where they can. So. I st- was part of a very extraordinary group of founding members who created Maisha 16 years ago because there was hardly anything that was being created out of the African continent at that time. And any time there would be stories few and far between in the out of Africa zone, you know, or white mischief about, you know, uh, a white woman having a neurotic breakdown in Kenya with a Maasai warrior, nameless and faceless in the background, those kinds of stories would come to me mm. because I lived there, because I had a whatever history there, whatever. And I would look at these stories that had nothing to do with the dignity and the everyday quality and the real power of where I lived. Mm. You know, the, 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 the extraordinary spirit of the people, the wisdom, the, the philosophy, philosophy that I was constantly around, and the fact that despite, in some senses, having nothing, they were completely full of humor and wisdom and how to how to make it how to keep going you know this was not the stories i was looking at on screen so this is what prompted the creation of the film school in maisha to create one's own stories one's own way uh, but at the highest level of craft and excellence and and now i think that we have you know really created a local film culture across the eastern countries you know across uganda kenya uh, uh, Tanzania and, and Rwanda. And now there are more than, the, at last count, we had 28 feature film directors who were considered, you know, who are alumni and who now mentor at Maisha themselves. I'm, in fact, thinking of now uh, making it a more of a community uh, space rather than a filmic space because the filmic space has already mm-hmm. taken root and it's quite wonderfully established. Well, as someone who grew up in what people call slums, um, it was a change to see joy and community watching Queen of Katwe. Um, was that intentional? Queen of Katwe is so utterly true to the spirit and to the streets of Katwe in Kampala. And the story of Fiona Mutesi is utterly true. I mean, Fiona sold water for a living till she was 11. She learns how to play chess in a return for a bowl of porridge. 
and she becomes a grandmaster in the years to come and takes her family out of the slum into this house which for which i actually planted the garden mm -hmm. outside uh, kampala and it's it's extraordinary and real and i was trying because i've lived there now so many years i was mining all that i enjoy and know between the fashion and the style and the slang and the humor but essentially creating a spirit of uh, how to play the fool you know how to make the uh, how to make a safe space so the kids who are essentially in some senses playing themselves like they did in years ago in salam bombay my other film on street kids in india they're playing themselves in part but they're also from the streets in any case mm. uh, in like in the story and they created such an extraordinary dialogue with the likes of lupita nyong'o and david oyelowo who are like hollywood stars but gratefully from the continent so they really know you know they also are sons and daughters of africa in that sense so that beautiful dialogue is what makes a queen of katwe you know just become more than itself because it's coming from a place of truth but in the hands of people who have lived that truth and who have the skill and talent including robert katende the great coach who teaches uh, fiona chess mm -hmm. um and all these people the real people and the people playing them were all together in this that is why the end of queen of katwe i introduce both of them so you see that it's not a period film it's a film that is now fiona was young and she still is you know um but it's a beautiful uh, film that did you know that deeply affected and is proven to affect education uh, around the continent of of the the whole continent because it has uh, it inspires young african kids to show that you can do it yourself you do not need that white savior you do not need someone coming in from the outside to tell you you know how to make that chess move um and you and it's it's so much about teachers you know it's so much about people who lift us from where we are and make us see uh what could be ahead uh, and that is the great gift of a person like robert katende you know who is right from katwe who's who's essentially never left mira nair i would love to talk to you for another 30 minutes uh but unfortunately <laughs> we've run out of time we have 30 seconds left what is uh some of the stuff that you're working on right now well i am working on getting a suitable boy scene across the world right now uh i'm also deeply immersed in the reading of this extraordinarily iconoclastic great artist from india uh called amrita shergill whose paintings have inspired me for years and she uh, she's basically one of she's india's greatest modern artist mm -hmm. and and uh, and no one really knows about her beyond the few mm -hmm. and i'm um, seeking to make a film about her life and her tragic death um and her most of all her extraordinary art um that's what i'm doing but mostly recovering from the insatiable boy <laughs> mira webley and yo and yo and yo <laughs> thank you so much very 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 come home to kampala to anuka thank you so much the agenda with steve pakin is brought to you by the chartered professional accountants of ontario cpa ontario is a regulator an educator a thought leader and an advocate we protect the public We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.